My name is Alan Krasner. I'm the chief endocrinologist at Cronetics Pharmaceuticals, which is based in San Diego, California. At Cronetics, we work to discover and develop uh, new drugs for patients with a variety of endocrine diseases, uh, and that includes uh, endocrine tumors as well. We are blessed to be working with a, uh, a very smart group of scientists who discover these uh, new drug candidates. We also have a very talented group who leads the development of those new drug candidates, including the clinical trials that are done to uh, evaluate the safety and efficacy of these new drugs. So this is what Cronetics does. It's a very exciting place to work. Acromegaly is uh, caused by uh, tumors in the pituitary gland, which oversecrete growth hormone. The pituitary gland is sort of the master gland located behind the sinus at the base of the brain. And the pituitary gland normally secretes a bunch of hormones, including growth hormone, which as the name would suggest, supports the growth of uh, children and adolescents as they're developing. However, growth hormone is always secreted to some extent, even after growth is uh, completed. And once in a while, the cells in the pituitary gland, which uh, make and secrete growth hormone into the bloodstream, can overgrow into a small benign tumor. These tumors, uh, when they oversecrete growth hormone, cause a disease we call, we call acromegaly. Acromegaly is uh, characterized by the very slow growth, oftentimes of soft tissues, sometimes noticeably in the jaw and other parts of the body. It also stimulates the growth of internal organs, uh, often in unhealthy ways. One of the kind of organs that can be damaged over time by acromegaly is the heart. And unfortunately, this disease, if untreated, can be associated with early mortality or premature death, oftentimes due to heart disease and sometimes from some other conditions as well. Over time, acromegaly can thicken uh, a lot of the tissues inside the body, including, for example, the tissues uh, which can entrap uh, the nerve in the wrists, and that can lead to carpal tunnel syndrome. It can also thicken tissues in the airway. This can lead to difficulty breathing and sleep apnea. It's often associated with diabetes, hypertension or high blood pressure, and, and heart disease. As I mentioned, there are actually a whole lot of potential complications of acromegaly over time. And as I mentioned, it's a very serious and insidious condition. It's also difficult to recognize that someone has this in many cases, and unfortunately, many patients, it can take years before someone confirms they actually do have acromegaly and to begin their treatment. And this delay is often not desirable because, it, as I mentioned, over time, uh, we can have complications from the acromegaly. And we would like to be able to discover this earlier than we often do these days. So the first step is for someone uh, to recognize the possibility that this person may have acromegaly. As I mentioned, a lot of times acromegaly presents to the healthcare provider with a very common condition like carpal tunnel syndrome. Carpal tunnel syndrome in the general population is very common. However, uh, someone also uh, uh, who sees a patient with say bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome in both wrists might notice the patient's visual appearance is suggestive of acromegaly, or the patient themselves may have noticed that their, their appearance has changed, and they've also developed some diabetes and some high blood pressure in addition to their carpal tunnel syndrome. With all those clues in place, we depend on someone to entertain the possibility that a, a new patient may have acromegaly. And when someone thinks about it, it's actually fairly straightforward to di diagnose once the diagnosis is suspected we typically would start with a simple blood test called insulin-like growth factor one level, an IGF-1 level. And most, the vast majority of patients with real acromegaly have an elevation in this IGF-1 level. And oftentimes that alone 
uh, can confirm the diagnosis of acromegaly biochemically. But again, the real challenge is first someone thinking that this patient may have this rare disease called acromegaly. Once once that diagnosis is entertained in general, the, the diagnostic uh, procedures thereafter are pretty straightforward. So once it's confirmed someone has acromegaly, the first step is to treat the tumor that's causing it. So as I mentioned, step one in diagnosis often is to measure the IGF-1 level in the blood. Once that is found to be elevated in a patient who clinically appears to have acromegaly, the next step is typically to obtain an MRI scan of the brain, particularly the pituitary region of the brain. In cases of acromegaly, almost always a tumor will be seen there. And that is at that point known to be the cause of the acromegaly. Uh, that tumor is secreting too much growth hormone. It's the growth hormone in excess that results in this other hormone called IGF-1 being produced, overproduced in the liver. Once that tumor is seen on the MRI scan, typically the first step in treatment is to ask a neurosurgeon to go in and remove that tumor to the greatest extent possible. And typically that involves what we call transphenoidal surgery, where a neurosurgeon will uh, use a scope-like device to go into in through the nose uh, behind the sinuses and take out as much of the tumor through that scope as possible. In about half the patients who are newly diagnosed with acromegaly, the neurosurgeon is successful in taking out all the tumor cell cells secreting excess growth hormones. So in other words, about half the patients are cured by surgery of their acromegaly. The other half of the patients, though, what's going on there is the tumor has been debulked or reduced in size by the surgeon, but there are still residual tumor cells in those patients, secreting too much growth hormone, leading to IGF-1 elevations that don't go to normal after surgery. And when that happens, patients are generally recommended that they start taking a medication to control or lower the growth hormone secretion from these tumors. The typical first-line medication that is used in patients who are not cured by surgery are injections of medications called either octreotide or lanreotide. These uh, medications have been around for a long time now and are quite effective at reducing the growth hormone secretion from the pituitary tumors and thereby allowing IGF-1 levels to normalize. The challenges though with these first line injections is A, they are injections and these are not trivial injections. They are very large uh, volume injections through fairly wide and painful needles that need to be injected usually into the gluteal space. For one of these drugs, it needs to be injected into the intramuscular space. And uh, these are uh, once a month admin uh, administrations. And so once a month, these patients uh, typically uh, uh, have to come to a healthcare provider to receive these injections. They are painful. They can also be disfiguring. It is also technically challenging, even for uh, experienced nurses or other healthcare providers, to deliver these very viscous solutions of medication to the appropriate uh, target space, uh, particularly the intramuscular space for octreotide is a real challenge. And so you can imagine there's a lot of burden associated with these injections, although they are effective at in a number of patients uh, correcting the biochemical abnormalities we see in acromegaly. There is clearly a lot of interest in an oral alternative for these standard injections that are used to treat these patients, usually lifelong for acromegaly that is not cured by surgery. Paltucetine is an investigational agent currently. It has been studied in clinical trials, some of which are still ongoing. Paltucetine, it is not the same sort of chemical that uh, we see in the injections. The injections need to be injected because they are very large peptide molecules. Paltucetine is an experimental small molecule which can be absorbed uh, through the GI tract and therefore it is uh, orally administered. Uh, in our clinical trials, and it's administered once per day. It is a tablet, which, uh, as I mentioned, has been studied uh, now in two large phase three trials uh, in patients with acromegaly. Phase three trials are the large studies 
which are used prior to submitting an application to the FDA for approval for a new drug. These studies are designed to formally evaluate the safety and efficacy of experimental drugs prior to submitting those applications to the FDA. Peltucidine has completed two large phase three trials, uh, at least the core portions of those trials. And actually, uh, based on the results of those trials, recently, Cronetics has submitted a new drug application or a new NDA to the FDA for uh, hopefully for approval someday of peltucetine for the treatment of acromegaly after the FDA has evaluated the data to evaluate uh, the safety and efficacy. And so actually the mechanism of action of peltucetine is very similar to that of octreotide and lanreotide. And uh, it has been shown in a variety of uh, both healthy volunteers and also patients with acromegaly to lower growth hormone and IGF-1 and secretion, which is the biochemical goal in these patients. The mechanism of action is actually a little bit distinct from octreotide in the sense that octreotide and lanreotide kind of can bind to related receptors in the pituitary cells as well as the key receptor, which is called SST2. SST2 is the one which is most potent at suppressing growth hormone secretion. Peltucetine is unique from octreotide in the sense that it only binds to that SST2 receptor. It doesn't interact with these other related somatostatin receptors that uh, the existing peptides cross-react with. The trials that have been done with peltucetine were uh, designed to evaluate real-world patients with acromegaly who need medication to control their acromegaly, both those who um, are already taking uh, treatments, in other words, already taking the injection treatments for acromegaly, and in one trial, they switch from the injections to oral peltucetine for a period of nine months. Uh, the other trial uh, evaluated patients who have not yet started uh, medication for their acromegaly when they need medication, or patients who have been treated but are not currently treated for acromegaly. And both trials together represent a package of data which allows the FDA to uh, evaluate the safety and efficacy of peltucetine in both groups of patients. Those patients who in clinical practice would potentially someday switch to peltucetine from their existing therapy versus those who are not on therapy now, but need therapy for their acromegaly. Both trials were designed to primarily measure this blood test we talked about, IGF-1. Remember, when you start out with acromegaly, your IGF-1 levels are high, and the goal in therapy is to bring those levels to normal. And that was precisely the primary endpoint for both trials. What is the percentage of patients who used peltucetine who uh, achieved a normal IGF-1 at the end of the peltucetine treatment period. And this was statistically compared to the percentage of patients who had normal IGF-1 who were randomly assigned to placebo. So these were both placebo control trials, and we were able to statistically compare the uh, normalization of IGF-1 rates in patients treated with peltucetine versus those who received placebo for the equal uh, length of time. All the patients in these trials were double-blinded. All the patients and the, and the investigators, the doctors who treated the patients in the trials did not know whether the study drug they were uh, dispensing to the patients was either active peltucetine versus placebo. Now in the trial we call Pathfinder 1, Pathfinder 1 was the switch trial. Those were patients who came into the study on the injected octreotide or lanreotide, first-line standard medications for patients who need medication with acromegaly. They were then randomly assigned to receive either peltucetine, switch to peltucetine, or to switch to placebo for a nine-month period. And at the end of the trial, we saw that patients who were assigned to switch to peltucetine uh, were able to maintain normal IGF-1 levels that they had at their baseline the vast majority of those patients were able to maintain IGF-1 at the end of the trial on peltucetine. Almost uh, only 4% or so of those randomized to placebo actually maintained their normal IGF-1 at the end of the treatment period. So you can see that peltucetine helped these patients switch 
successfully without paying a price with regard to losing their biochemical control of their acromegaly. And it was clearly statistically uh, different than what was seen in patients who switched to placebo. Now, in every trial, we also look at a whole lot of other measurements uh, besides the primary one I mentioned. And in all of the secondary endpoints that we assessed in this trial, we also showed that uh, paltucetine patients did better than placebo statistically in this trial as well. One of those secondary endpoints is a measurement of the control of acromegaly symptoms in these patients. Because we're not just trying to treat blood test results in, in clinical medicine. We're also trying to make sure the patients feel better and control the symptomatic aspects of their disease, as well as the biochemical problems that we see in the bloodstream. So one of these secondary endpoints was a quantitative measure of symptom control. And we showed statistical benefits in the paltucetine arm versus placebo as well in this Pathfinder 1 trial. Pathfinder 2 was this other trial in patients who are not currently on medical treatment for their acromegaly, but need medical treatment. And we know they need medical treatment at baseline because their IGF-1 levels are all elevated by the time they're randomized to receive either paltucetine or placebo in this trial. These patients were treated for six months in this trial. <clears throat> and again, the primary measurement was the same. The percentage of patients who achieve, in this case, normal IGF-1 on paltucetine versus placebo. And again, there was a clear statistically significant benefit with paltucetine versus placebo treatment. In Pathfinder 2, once again, the percentage of patients who achieve normal IGF-1 on paltucetine was significantly greater than seen on placebo. And again, all of the secondary endpoints, including symptom control, also showed significant benefits compared to placebo. The interesting thing we learned about paltucetine in Pathfinder 2 is that in these Currently uncontrolled patients, paltucetine helped to bring down IGF-1 levels to normal very, very quickly. Really, within two to four weeks, we saw IGF-1 coming down from their high levels at baseline. And thereafter, that sharply reduced average IGF-1 was sustained through the duration of the trial. That actually, I think, is an important attribute because one of the problems with these long-acting injections is that they're kind of slow to kick in. They're also very slow to wash out. There's also multiple different doses of the injection. So typically what you do is a patient who has just been diagnosed with acromegaly and not cured by surgery, now they start one of these injections at a certain dose. And now you have to wait three months for that particular dose to reach kind of a steady state before you decide if that dose is effective to normalize their IGF-1. If it's not, then you have to increase the dose. And now you wait at least another three months before you can assess whether they are adequately treated. The paltucetine data gives me hope that actually now we have something that hopefully there would be something once this is evaluated and approved by the FDA that you could assess within a few weeks and determine if the dose is correct. There are two dose choices uh, for paltucetine. There's a starting dose of 40 milligrams. It, the data suggests that if that's not effective to normalize IGF-1 at the first dose, then it could be up titrated to 60 milligrams. And then a few weeks later, within a few weeks, you can determine uh, if, if the patient is, is adequately responding. The other thing is if you start a certain dose of these injections, and they are having trouble, patients having some side effects from the injections. And there are some side effects associated with this whole class of therapy. Usually kind of mild GI uh, adverse events are very common with these uh, drugs. Uh, we saw this with paltucetine as well. Generally with continued therapy, they tend to wane and get better. However, if someone should have a problem with toleration after an injection, you really have to wait a while for that to wash out before the AE might improve. Paltucetine is a small molecule which kicks in quickly. It also, if necessary, can wash out much faster as well in those kinds of situations. So um, I think there's a lot of interesting data uh, in both Pathfinder trials, which I think uh, point to how it might be used in clinical practice someday, pending the FDA's review of the new drug application that has been uh, submitted 
and pending their agreement that uh, it is safe and effective and uh, approved for marketing authorization.